Good evening and welcome to the program. My guest tonight is Dr. Yak Panksep, who is the Bailey Endowed Chair of Animal Wellbeing Science and Professor of Veterinary and Comparative Anatomy, Pharmacy and Physiology at Washington State University. He has also been Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Bowling Green State University and Head of Effective Neuroscience Research at the Falk Center for Molecular Therapeutics at Northwestern University. He's the author of several books, most recently, Archaeology of Mind, Neuroevolutionary Origins of Human Emotion, and also known for the seminal textbook, Effective Neuroscience, The Foundations of Human and Animal Emotions. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Pankstep here to the table to discuss his latest work on play and laughter in animals and the nature of the effective mind in general. Welcome, Dr. Pankstep, and thank you for coming to talk with me. Pleasure to be here. You are a psychobiologist. What is psychobiology? Psychobiology is a long word for a simple thing. You want to understand the mind by looking at the brain. And uh, the brain is the biology part, and the psycho is the mind part. And uh, these are very hard to bring together. It's a lot easier to study behavior, and that's what people do. But there's been a cognitive revolution now for about 20 years. And uh, it's a very exciting topic, and no one has yet been able to solve the puzzle, even provisionally. How does the brain create experience? And experience is the fundamental form of consciousness. A lot of people use awareness, but awareness is a very complex concept. It implies you know that you had an experience. So if one really wants to understand consciousness, one has to take an evolutionary approach. One has to look for the lowest common denominator, and our impression is that it has to be feelings. It has to be emotions. It has to be sensory feelings like pain and pleasure, hunger and thirst. If you understand those, I think you have a beginning a beginning to? A beginning to understanding what experience is, what consciousness is, and also what emotions are. I mean, uh, right now, people think consciousness exists in the top of the brain, the neocortex. And that's a very debatable issue because a paper just came out uh, from University of Iowa. Uh, and uh, they asked the question when a human being is getting old and developing dementia like Alzheimer's and they can't remember things and they can't think. They asked a very simple question. What if we uh, try to provoke a feeling, happiness and sadness? Is there a problem there? And the answer was no problem. <laughs> People could still feel happy and sad totally normally. But, of course, their higher mind was deteriorating. So that tells us that feelings, that kind of consciousness, is very different than our knowledge-based consciousness. And the majority of people are looking at knowledge as opposed to experience. But you can't start at the top. You have to start at the bottom. You have to start where evolution first built experience into the brain. I think at this point in time, we can be sure that every mammal on the face of the earth has experiences, okay? If you really look at it, uh, if you look at all the evidence, we can be sure that animals feel their emotions. When you say feel, you mean? I mean that uh, when a rat is scared, uh, it is scared. If another rat is scared, it is scared. They are having the same type of feeling. Doesn't it be precisely the same, but they are having a very, very similar category of feelings. Then the question is, why is that subjective? If we can measure what fear is, mm -hmm. why is that not empirical? Well, uh, I'm, I'm the first one in the world to say that emotions and emotional feelings are empirical. 
It's my colleagues that say it's subjective, but it's both subjective and it's empirical. In other words, if you want to understand experience, there's nothing you can do in the external world that gets you there because the world is full of individual little experiences and each of them are different for different people. We're in different environments with different memories, with different hopes and aspirations. The internal experience rides upon something that is the same in all human beings. And my argument has been in affective neuroscience that the experience is the same in all mammals. So when your dog looks like it's happy, in fact, it is happy. It's not just describing a possibility. It is a reality. When you leave your house and your dog is maybe your only pet, and that doggy is running around and whining, crying, basically, the way a dog cries, that dog is feeling panic, distress. I'm alone. And uh, until we came uh, to study that specific phenomenon back in the early 70s, there hadn't been anyone in the species called Homo that had ever asked that question. What is it actually, that psychological pain? And we asked it, and we got very clear answers. The separation cry, the cry of loneliness, is controlled by the same chemistries as physical pain. So psychological pain allows the panic to occur. The panic tells who's valuable to me. So, so the real question, though, is the real experience. And uh, you cannot even begin to answer that question without neuroscience. And a lot of scientists do not realize it. I think a lot of humanists do not realize it. Because, uh, you know, the humanists live experience. Artists, writers, poets, filmmakers. And, uh, you know, they simply accept the experience is there. But that is simply a statement of uh, straightforward acceptance of reality. Now a scientist has to come and explain what is the nature of that reality. They have to get under the surface. And the only way to get under the surface of an emotional feeling is to go into the brain. And 